So I go here, MIT. But what do I study? I know some of you guys might have thought I study biology, artificial intelligence. And I'm sorry to disappoint you in the crowd, but I don't think about machine learning on a blockchain in the cloud using the Internet of Things. What I study is something sexy, something incredibly sexy. Are there, are, there, are there any guesses? What do I love talking about? That's right, the electric grid. I think this is amazing. And I'd like to invite you all today to think about how, despite how mundane it looks, the electric grid is perhaps the most important machine and most sexy machine of our time. But before I dive in, let me, let me tell you how I got here. I've had, the, I've had an interesting childhood. Interesting in the sense that I've lived in 12 countries. So and I see some of you guys already running through the math, trying to, I promise you, I'm not lying. A speaker on stage would never lie to their captive audience. And so with that, it, it, it's always a tough question of where'd you grow up? And so, I mean, do I say North Korea? Do I say Sri Lanka? Do I say Italy? I don't know. So it begs the question, why do you move around so much? And I have my parents to thank for that. My father works for the World Food Program. My mother used to. And for those of you that don't know, the World Food Program is uh, a branch of the United Nations dedicated to tackling world hunger. And they took that noble mission to heart. You'd have a very tough time wasting food at my house, you know, trying to sneak away the Brussels sprouts into the trash can. <laughs> and so because of those different perspectives that I've had, I've seen many takes on what I think are similar problems. Energy, for example. Now, when I was six or seven years old, living in Sri Lanka, I was very cognizant of the fact that many seven-year-olds around the globe went to bed hungry. But then, you know, I'd see the fridge at my own home stocked, the school cafeteria was stocked with food, the supermarket shelves were stocked with food, and just like you guys, I'd seen many pictures like this of endless fields of green or grain. And I'd ask myself, why? So I did what many young children do, I'd go and pester my parents, so I went to my dad and I said, Hey, Pops, why is it that people go hungry? That's a tough question. And you know, you know how fathers tend to just dive into lecture? They, they make everything. I was just trying to strike up a casual conversation, and he, he, he proceeded and told me something that I think is very profound and counterintuitive. He said, you know, Bella, food insecurity isn't so much that we don't have enough food. We make a lot of food. We have plenty of food. The problem is distribution and coordination of the stakeholders involved in the process. Wow. What was said to me 13 years ago was, and I still think is profound. That, that really changed me. Now, I want to, it's my, it's my hope that in thinking about this, we'll think about how the electric grid, how we can reimagine it. So when I was in Freetown, Sierra Leone, which was in 2017, we get maybe a full day of electricity for every two days without it. And so although I fondly remember playing card games by candlelight with my siblings or getting scolded by my younger brother for hogging the last precious charge of my mother's iPad, the country has plenty in the way of hydro resources. So I'd ask myself, why? Why? And then, you know, growing up, I seen the wealth disparities in Dubai or the disparities between the Kibera slum versus the rich uh, Gigiri expat estate in Nairobi, Kenya. And it was clear to me that just like food, wealth, energy, having a lot of it is just half the equation. What's more important is the distribution and the coordination of agents within the system. Back to this supermodel. You guys can hold your oohs and your ahs. The electric grid is mind-bogglingly complex. Very, very complicated. In fact, you know, some say that making modifications to the electric grid is like making modifications or repairs to an airplane while it's in flight. Yikes, right? That's kind of scary. Well, imagine, I mean, you're flying up six miles in the air. There's a repairman on board. He brings out a hammer, begins hammering away, makes some mistakes, goes, damn, pulls out a roll of duct tape to cover it up. That's the electric grid, I think, for many parts of the world. They are, I think, for the most part, patchwork and held by nothing more than duct tape. And I think this is especially true for, for the more matured grids. For the nascent grids, it's also, it's also the case. And so this is a precarious situation to be in, especially with how fast things are changing, face of things like climate risk and changing energy usage and demand patterns. So it's my hope today that today's talk will, will serve as a blueprint for the future electric grids of burgeoning and mature economies alike. So, let's get into it, shall we? 
Let's think about the electric grid in the same kind of distributed way, abstract way we think about the internet. That is, we see ethernet cables, satellite dishes, cell towers, fiber optic cables, and yet we know intuitively that those things alone don't make the internet. What makes the internet are mobile devices and people interacting over these enabling technologies. So in the same way, power lines, large spinning generators, aren't the only things that makes the grid. And in fact, let's, let's tell a story. The characters in the story are distributed energy resources. That is us. That means we can go out of our way and drive electric vehicles, purchase solar panels, install batteries in our homes, participate in demand response. But the thing is, the grid, and it's a very centralized architecture and paradigm, wasn't designed with us in mind. The story I'm going to share with you today is one of a distributed, autonomous, dynamic, and connected energy future. The DERs are the things that are sitting at the bottom. Once again, these include things like solar panels, batteries, and et cetera. You can see how this image looks rather unneat. In fact, DERs can cause stability problems. So we've got the electrical infrastructure. Sitting above that, we've got the physical communication network, sensing and control, logical communication network. But this is where I want you guys to pay attention. This is where we need to innovate. This is where the agents reside. So we need to make them smarter through machine intelligence. So for those of you who are interested in AI, this, this is your time to shine. Services and apps. And think about the peer-to-peer -peer markets that could flourish with a distributed energy future. OK, brilliant. Now that that detour is over, let's move on. I want to talk about grid defection. So I expect grid defection will be commonplace in the next few years. And this is actually not a recent or new phenomena. So grid defection, what it means is that people go out of their way to become energy self-sufficient. They'll actively view the grid, the main grid, as a last resort. And my parents tell me that in 2002 to 2005 in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, it was actually cheaper to run the main office of an on-site diesel generator than it was the main grid. And then DR heterogeneity. So remember what I said about distributed energy resources? Well, I believe the future electric grid will come to be characterized by the number, heterogeneity, and flexibility of these DERs. And most crucially, whether they are willing and capable to work with one another towards goals. But remember what I said about DERs causing some instability? You know, solar panels really aren't all sunshine and rainbows from a grid stability perspective. And let's motivate this with an example. Suppose we have two buildings, one building with a battery and another building with a solar panel. We'll call them Bob for battery and Alice for an awesome solar panel. And so they're connected via the main common grid. And there are two constraints of relevance when we talk about electricity. There's, there are capacity constraints and there are frequency constraints. And we can imagine it as them, really, these DRs giving and taking from a shared bucket of water. Right? If they do so frantically, you get this picture. They make a mess. That maps to the frequency constraints on the grid. You've maybe heard of, in the US, that the grid is at 60 hertz. Well, that's what this refers to. And we'll just say, I won't get into it too much, but a violation of this frequency constraint can lead to blackouts, equipment damage, and just a whole slew of bad stuff, TM. So what's the solution? Well, I've kind of hinted at it, right? That was the original premise for the talk. Coordination. Communication. Now look at this picture. This looks a lot better, doesn't it? No mess. Here, Bob and Alice, their DERs combine in a way to create a hybrid asset for which it's the value of its sum is greater than the sum of its parts. In this graphic here, Bob says, OK, I'll do Z if you agree to do X at time Y, to which Alice might go through the calculus and say OK. Look how much better and coordinated this picture looks. Having this communication plus coordination, we can accommodate more DERs. And the reason we can accommodate more DERs is because they work together now in ways such that they mitigate the stress that they'd otherwise cause the grid. And so we're now one large step closer to having a grid that is a lean, mean, green energy machine. And the beauty of it is that we can take a bunch of these Alice and Bob arrangements and we can cut and paste them with different permutations of DERs. So we can have, you know, the thermostat HVAC systems, electric vehicles, batteries, solar panels. And then we can have the intelligence for the agents, because they're autonomous, either sit 
within the agents themselves or reside at the cloud. And this is the future we can have. If you look at this graphic, you can see those communities. You can see how these communities can, made, can be made autonomous. Now, I contend that the technology to achieve this distributed energy future already exists. In fact, a lot of my work and research is concerned with developing them all into a single platform, especially that communications platform you'd seen with, with Alice and Bob. But the thing is, I'm, I'm just a single guy from Freetown, Sierra Leone. And I believe that in the audience here, in the people watching online, people in Beijing, Sydney, and wherever, I hope I've convinced you all today that the electric grid is sexy, or rather what it can be is sexy, or sexier. Thank you. <laughs>